want you to take a look at this verse here. This is out of John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. We love this one, don't we? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of commandments that Jesus offers us that, that, frankly, when we find ourselves in conversation within the church or outside of the church, we don't always jump right into wanting to talk about particular commandments from Jesus. But this one, the commandment to love one another, we love this one. We talk about this one all the time. Um, I've been in, in, in full-time ministry for, for 17 years now, and honestly, there's really no way for me to have ever kept count for a number of times that I have had someone just come up to me, or I've been in a meeting at a church, or a conversation with fellow believers, where this isn't just often just kind of batted around. Man, we just need to, we just need to love one another. And on, on, on that last night that Jesus had with his disciples, the last thing he wanted ringing in their ears is this commandment to, to love one another. If we, just, man, if we just love one another, everything's going to fall right into place and it's going to be just fine. Love one another. We love to talk about this command. What I've found we don't love to do is actually talk about what on earth we mean by this. <laughs> like, what, what do we mean when we say, man, we just need to love one another? It's one of the things that I've found to be true about, about myself, uh, about fellow believers, about the church, about Christians. We love declaration without definition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we love to toss things out there and just assume that everybody knows exactly what we mean. You know, I don't know if there's ever been a time where I've heard someone toss out there this commandment. And we just, we need to, we need to love one another. And I've never really heard anyone say, and what I mean by that exactly is, and then they color it in and define it, declaration without definition. In fact, I think sometimes if we were to have someone say to us, man, we just need to love one another, and we were to fire back, okay, but what does that mean for us to love one another? I think some of the folks who say that would almost roll their eyes at us and be like, everybody knows what that means. Just love one another. But what does it mean, Westbrook? And really, honestly, the thing is, is it's not actually mostly important what we think it means. What did Jesus mean? When he said this commandment. I mean, if Jesus is the one who gave us this commandment, it feels right that he should be able to get a word in edgewise about what is meant by loving one another. And so you're going to go into this series, all you need is love. Okay, but what is love, right? Well, let's, let's define it. So here, here's what I want to do. And so I, I want us to just break down that phrase, love one another. So if we want to go to the next slide I've got here, I, I just want to break this down just in very simple parts, okay? Let, let's talk about what on earth Jesus means by love, because I think that's really very important. In fact, it might be even more important what he doesn't mean by love. And then I want to talk about the second half of this phrase, one another, one another. Let's just, let's just break this down this morning to get rolling with this series in the next few weeks that you're going to have together. First of all, let's talk about love. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about love? Now, now some of you have maybe been in the church a while and you know that in the New Testament world, at that time, at the time of Jesus, really the world had kind of been pulled together under one empire, the Roman Empire, in the midst of all this Greco-Roman culture. They also had pulled together the world under one language, the Greek language. And so the New Testament is written in Greek. And, and one of the things that I find very fascinating is that there were a number of words in the Greek language for love that Jesus could have used. And I do think it's really important for us to understand the word that Jesus did use, but sometimes it's even more important to know the words for love that were available to him in the Greek language that he didn't use. And one of the words in Greek for love that Jesus could have used, but he chose not to use in John 13 when he says, this new commandment I give you, to love one another, one of the Greek words was the word eros, sometimes pronounced eros, depending on its context, E-R-O-S. Now, now look, some of you, I don't know, again, if you kind of grew up in the church and, and maybe you have a little bit of an understanding of the Greek language, uh, your, your eyebrows are shooting up and you're thinking, well, of course Jesus didn't use the word eros. And the reason be, is because our English word erotic comes from the Greek word eros. And so you're sitting here and you think to yourself, well, of course, Brian, Jesus did not use that word because that would be weird. That would be very, very strange, right? I mean, you imagine the kind of churches Jesus would be trying to pull together based on that kind of love. Actually, you probably should not imagine the kind of churches that he would pull together based on that kind of love. But see, here's, here's the problem that we have on this is that because there's been so much baggage attached to that word over time, we don't realize that at the time of Jesus, there was kind of a more general understanding of this kind of 
of love. You know, I, I don't know if you spend very much time in philosophy. I'm going to tell you up front, I don't. It bores me out of my ever-loving mind in ancient philosophy. But sometimes you really do need to understand what were some of the philosophical leanings at the time of Jesus. And you get into some of that stuff about, you know, the guys we read about, Socrates and Plato and some of these others. And Socrates was one of the first, you know, 300 some years before Jesus even arrives on the scene. And Socrates is the one who really starts talking about an, an eros kind of love. And, and this was long before it started to take on all of the erotic and kind of sexual baggage that we attach to it. What he talked about is, is he said, look, we come into this world and, and we have needs. We, we have desires because we have these needs that we want to have fulfilled. And, and Socrates says, you know, we walk into the world and we see something beautiful and we see something that offers us something so rich and it can really satisfy something in us in the human needs that we have and so we go to it and we want it and we crave it and we take it and we get, we get, we get, we look to get. That's at the heart of what's meant in this idea of an eros that drives us. It's about wanting to make sure our needs are being met. Finding in this relational context someone who I feel can meet that need and so I get that from them. I get, I get, I get. But this is not the idea that Jesus grabbed a hold of in John 13 when he says, Love one another. I mean, he could have come along if he wanted to and says, you know what, guys, about 300 years ago, Socrates was hitting a nail on the head when he talked about this idea that, man, you have needs and you go into the world and particularly you find people that can meet those needs. And, and of course you desire that and go and get what's yours. But I want us to stop for a moment and think to ourselves, what if Jesus had used that word? In John 13, it says, hey, this new commandment I give you, love one another with that kind of love that looks to get, 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 get. I mean, you can't imagine what kind of churches we would have because there would be no church. There would be no church. People who, who just come together, and, and listen, this is very important for us to think about because what we often do when we come into the church is what? We come in thinking to ourselves, what might these people offer me? Guys, that is eros love. That's looking only to get, 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 get. And this will not provide you with life, and it will not provide your neighbors with life, both within Westbrook and outside of the Westbrook community, will it? Because eros love is textbook parasitic love. See, this thing that I think is brilliant, that even if Jesus, even if Jesus had not specifically and directly told us that this is not the kind of love that I want for my people, the world of nature would tell us we ain't getting anywhere with that kind of love. Because that's how parasites operate, isn't it? Parasites go out into their environment and they look for something that is living and that is thriving, and they go and they latch onto it and they suck it dry of life that it might live. But after a while, even a parasite can't live if it runs out of living organisms to suck dry of their life. Nature Nature will not stand if every relationship is people going out looking to get, 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 looking first to take what is theirs. Textbook parasitic relationships. That's why Jesus says, you know, when, I, when he says love one another, he doesn't use the word eros, and that's really important. In fact, the word that he uses, and again, some of you grew up in the church maybe, and you, you know a little bit of Greek to be dangerous, and so maybe you know that the word that Jesus uses for love is what? Agape. Agape. And it really is this fascinating word because outside of a couple of occurrences in, 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 in the philosopher Homer in, in ancient literature, the Bible is the only source from the ancient world that used this word. It, 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 as, as some scholars say, it's like God grabbed a hold of a word for love that the world hadn't messed up yet. Agape love. And you ask yourself, what, 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 what is agape love? If I speak very generally, it's simply this. It, it is the exact opposite of eros love. It is a love that walks into every single relational context and looks first to give rather than get. Every occurrence of agape in the New Testament, if you stretch your way back to the Old Testament and study the Hebrew word that most lines up with the Greek word agape, you do all of your research in all of the different circumstances and the relational context, it is always the image of someone stepping into circumstances and not being driven by the question, what can I get from these people? But it is a people who go into and among another people and say, what might I give them? 
It, it, it's, it's not a people that go into a situation and say, what have you done for me lately? It is a people who instead come in and say, what have I done for you lately? How might I give, 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 give? And it's the only way there's life. And this is what Jesus calls us to in John chapter 13. In fact, if you, if you go, if we go to the next slide here, uh, John 13, later on, in the, in the fullest aspect of the verse, this is actually what Jesus says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. In fact, what Jesus is saying is, man, if you want to define what agape love is, look at me. The dictionary is my life. The dictionary is my ministry. And think about the context of when Jesus first starts to talk about this loving one another within the church. You want to know what it looks like? Jesus is saying, well, what did I just do in John chapter 13? But at one moment I was sitting at a table and I recognized that your feet have not been washed and that you have a need. And it says in John 13 that Jesus realized that even though all power and authority had been given to him by the Father, he pushed himself away from the table. He grabbed a basin of water and a towel. He got down on his hands and knees and he washed their feet. Give, give, give. What's the context of this? You, you want to know what agape love looks like? What, what, what happens soon after this? This commandment is given just moments before Jesus would be betrayed, handed over to the authorities, sit in a sham of a trial, and be crucified for the life of all of humanity. Give. 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 Jesus says that's the love you must have for one another within the church. And if you don't, the church will not stand. I mean, Jesus doesn't even have to say this to us as directly as he does in John chapter 13. Because again, just look again at nature. It will not stand if we go any other direction away from a people being sent out who look first to give rather than get. Everything will fall apart. We have all of these relationships just in nature. You know, you get bees and flowers and you, you've, you've got, you know, those, those little crazy birds in Africa that are perched on the back of rhinoceroses. And you're like, how does that work? Well, it works because they figured out a relationship where they're they're both looking to give that they then ultimately might get so that all of nature just works a little bit better. It's brilliant what Jesus says here because even if just one person in the church starts to flip over to that eros thing, looking first to get, that, that, that's one little corner of the church where just love starts to die and where the things that God's wanting to do start to die because selfishness starts to seep in. We can't tip the scales at all in the direction of looking first to get. It's got to be all of us firing on all cylinders, walking into every single relational context saying, I have come to look first to give. What have I done for you lately? It flips the script on how we search for churches, doesn't it? Because you step in not saying, well, what does this place have to offer my family? What does my family have to offer this beautiful people? Any way you flip it, if you go any other direction, it starts to fall apart. This is the love that Jesus has called us to. Because it's the only way life comes into the world. And so when we go around and we, when we start tossing out there, hey, you know, we just need to, we just need to love one another. You're absolutely right. I'm absolutely right to say that. But what do we mean by that? Well, love, love, love is me looking first to give rather than get. And man, let's keep that understanding ever under our noses, right? Because isn't it, isn't it incredibly easy and you don't even realize it to slip in another kind of love where you look first to get? I remember this moment I, I was sharing with some folks before the service started that we had done a church plant on the west side of Indianapolis. We'd been a part of this church plant for about five years and and I remember very early on, a, a fellow by the name of Tom came to me. Tom's about, he's about 30 years my senior. And he came to me and said, you know, Brian, I really think, I really think we ought to start a men's ministry. And we get together, we'll, we'll get, go down to Flapjacks there on 40 at the restaurant. We'll, we'll get there at like 6 o'clock and we'll have a study and, and prayer and all of this. And I'm like, man, that sounds great, Tom. That sounds really wonderful. And then, and then he drops it on me and says, you know, and I'd, really, I'd really like for you to be a part of it. And I said, well, first of all, you already said 6 o'clock in the morning. And I remember, I remember going home, and I was telling my wife, Sarah, about that. We were having dinner. And I started telling her about my conversation with Tom. And I said, well, he, he was going to start this men's ministry and all this kind of stuff. And, and I said, you know, he, he'd really like for me to be a part of it. And I said, I, I, I just don't know. And she said, well, why not? And I said, well, first of all, he said 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but, but I said even, even deeper than that, like, I just don't think I, 
like, I don't, I don't really need that. I know that sounds terrible as a minister to say, but like, I, don't, I just feel like I don't, I don't need it. Like, I, I, I've been able to get what I need through other friendships and relationships that I have. And it got really quiet. And I can tell you that when it gets really quiet, that usually means I'm in trouble, okay? And, and Sarah just very quietly said, has it ever occurred to you that maybe Tom needs this? And I got really quiet. And then I finally said to her, it has just now occurred to me <laughs> that maybe Tom needs this. Tom, 30 years my senior, who has, for the last, I think, 10, 11 years, every single day been caring for his wife, who's a paraplegic because of a tragic automobile accident. Takes two hours to dress her for bed, wakes in the middle of the night to turn her, two hours to get her showered and ready for work. Tom needed this, and my prevailing thought is, I don't know, what will I get? I can call that a lot of things, but most notably what I call that is Eros love. But for me to look to give would be much more in line with what Jesus said. So, if we go back to the slide where I break this down, love, love one another, we, we've covered love. Don't forget there's the second part. You're like, yay, okay. And, and here's, the, here's the really good news. The second part's the worst part. <laughs> one another. Love, so love one another with the kind of love that steps into every single relational context looking first to give rather than get. And you do that for one another. Now here's the reason why I said that. That just strikes me sometimes as the worst part in this whole phrase of love one another. Because I, I don't know what strikes you about one another, but man, that's really wide open, isn't it? Like one of the things that drives me nuts about one another is someone says one another and I, my, my first response is, well, goodness gracious, that could be anybody. That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. It's the same thing as when Jonathan's up here and tells you, why don't you take a, a few moment, uh, moments and, and, and greet one another. We sit there and we can sit there and wait for Jonathan to tell us, could you tell me exactly who I need to greet? Or you just recognize, well, what he means is, there's probably someone to my right and I greet them. And there's someone to my left and I greet them. And, and if they're greeting someone else, I turn around and it's the person behind me. This is the power of all of the one another's of scripture. Is that it's whoever is flanking you, it's whoever's in front of you, who's ever behind you, it it is who you're by. You know, we're, we're going with this song by the Beatles, Love is All You Need. How about the one that came out in the 70s? Love the one you're with. It's talking about the one and others. You know, who, well, who, who do I need to show that kind of love to? Well, him and her and him and her and him and her. It's, it's wide open, isn't it? Now, I will pick on myself. But one of the things you need to know, preachers pick on themselves, it's a passive-aggressive way to pick on you too. So, <laughs> I will pick on myself, and you too. <laughs> but look, I, if, I, if I'm honest, there, I, I think by the grace of God and the direction of the Spirit of God, I have found my way toward loving some folks in a way where I look first to give to them rather than get from them. And this isn't some like heroic thing I'm saying. I said, by the grace of God and by the direction of the Spirit. And, and trust me, I fight against it a lot. But I have found my way. But, but the confession I have to offer to you, and I'm not proud of this confession, is that I have often stumbled into very carefully selecting who gets that. And what I find fascinating is that if I, if, I, if I were to draw up a list of the people that I have looked first to give to them rather than get from them, to really embrace that kind of agape love that, that Jesus calls us to, it is really amazing how much those people look like me. It's amazing how much those people, man, they laugh at the same things I laugh at. They, they, they want to be a part of their interest in the same things that I'm interested in. It's amazing how those people that I've shown that love to, I, I consider them pretty well-adjusted people. Because then I can manage how much work I have to do, right? Or if they've got problems, I very carefully selected the people who have problems that look like me because then I think to myself, well, I might have something to offer them because I kind of struggle with that too. I've been really careful in how I've selected the people I've shown this love to. And then Jesus comes along and shatters it. One another. 
And you struggle with that too. Even in your moments of breakthrough and you celebrate and you realize, man, I, basically what I've done is I have chased after people that I think I can be best friends with. See, this is where I think we need to circle back and understand another word that was for love in Greek that Jesus did not use. Philia. Sometimes used as phileo. Now, you're familiar with this Greek more than you think because Philadelphia, philia, do you hear the base on that? And what, what does that mean? The city of brotherly love. And it gets to this idea of warmth and fuzziness. It, it, it's the kind of idea that when you, when you study the occurrence of this word, either in the Bible or, or in other ancient literature, it really is the kind of stuff of, of, of friendship. There's a real warmth there. It's, it's the people that you, you really do prefer because you have those shared interests. They look like you. They talk like you. They laugh like you. They cry like you. Philia love would be the kind of word they would use to describe the kind of stuff we see on Thursday night sitcoms where everyone who looks the same sits in a coffee shop. Ha, 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 having fun. And yet when Jesus says we need to love one another, it's, it's fascinating that out of the cloud of all the Greek words you could use, he said, we're not using philia. It's, it's, it's a stunning thing to realize. Jesus isn't ultimately concerned whether or not in the church or even outside of the church and the neighbors we have, the co-workers we have, Jesus really isn't all that concerned about us finding our next best friend. Jesus doesn't seem to be really all that concerned about us trying to carefully find what we had in college, man, or, or, or what we had with that one circle of friends at our last church. It's agape love. Which fascinatingly again, if you go to all the occurrences of agape love in the Old and New Testaments alike, you see all of these relational contexts. And honestly, it's fascinating because you really don't see a whole lot of people where you think to themselves, oh man, yeah, they love each other, but I don't think necessarily they're going to exchange Christmas cards. <laughs> in fact, I, I think about what, what if Jesus had tried to, to, to push the church in the direction of this is a place where you find your best friend. And again, I don't think Jesus would have a problem with us finding our best friends within a church community or with a neighbor, a coworker, and even folks who don't believe just as we do. He's not going to say, no, stop that. He, what he, I think he's saying is if you find that, that's great. But if you don't, guess what? It's still a good work to give to them. So if you imagine what would have happened, imagine the kind of church is built on friendly love, warm and fuzzy love. You can't. There would be no church. I mean, what, what, what's the very first example of the church that we have? It's the 12 disciples. It really is. And Jesus says to them in this upper room, you, need, you, guys, need to, you guys need to love one another. And if he had said that with a friendly love, do you really think they would have held together? See, this is one of the things I find fascinating. I mean, you look at the lives of the disciples. We, we really do imagine that it kind of looked like an episode out of a Thursday night sitcom. Them sitting around a campfire laughing, joking, being best buddies forever. Have you read some of the stories of the interactions between the disciples? I mean, what, two, three different times they get into arguments about, you know what, I actually think I'm the one that Jesus is going to put top of the line and in charge here. Two of the guys send their mom over to Jesus once in the presence of the rest so that she would ask, which I just love, that she would go and ask and find out, hey, when you inherit the kingdom of God and establish all of that, can my son sit at your right and left? I'm sure that went over really well with the other ten. I mean, do you really think that Matthew, a tax collector, was going to be best friends with Simon the Zealot? Do you know what zealots were in the ancient world? They hated the Roman Empire, and most notably, those that were taxing them. They carried around a dagger that they might kill someone if they're ever called to rebellion. I don't think Matthew and Simon exchanged Christmas cards. You think about Peter when he's called at the very end of John's Gospel. You remember in the midst of that, remember the number one question that Peter had is, well, what, what, what's going to happen with John? Are you going to give him a better deal? But they loved each other with a love that said, hey, this isn't always going to be about warmth if we find it great. But this is about a mission that we're on. And if we stumble into friendship, Great. But if we are just held together by a shared belief and a shared conviction of the only way the world will find life is for us to band together in this, then this is what is good and holy in the eyes of God. 
This is what we mean when Jesus comes along and says, love one another. See, we, we toss this around a lot, and I don't think we, are, we, we stop enough to consider he's calling us to love a whole host of people. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves of this because, boy, again, it's so easy to slip into this where we're just looking for what we once had and loved the most and that warmth and that fuzziness. I mean, I know what was driving me more than anything else with that men's group is when, when, when Tom brought that up and the idea of that, you know, I just thought to myself, that really, it just magnified what I really missed with the circle of guys I'd gone to college with and to seminary with. We met every single week. And to be honest with you, man, we looked the same, we talked the same, we wrestled with the same things, we laughed at the same things, we cried over the same things, and I missed that. And Tom bringing this up is like, that's never going to replace it. I want that. I can call that a number of things, but what I most notably call that is a flea of love. What Tom was pulling me out of beautifully, he's pulling me out of that and into an agape love. And I'll tell you, what ended up happening with that ministry looked nothing like what I had in college and seminary. I didn't end up with a circle of best friends. But listen, I ended up with brothers. Why do you think the Bible is so quick to not necessarily speak of us as friends, but as brothers and sisters? It runs deeper than warmth many times, doesn't it? It's funny that when things were going south for us at a recent ministry, you know who one of the first people was who called me? It actually wasn't the guys from college and seminary. It was Tom, 30 years my senior. Doesn't look, talk, think a thing like me. But he called me and said, Brian, I love you. How can I pray for you? And this is love. This is love. So I have this question. For us. If you're, if you're going to go any further in the series, all you need to love, let's look at this last side here. This, this is the question we need to really wrestle through. And if on the other side of this, you say, like, yeah, and let's keep coming back for this series because Mont and Rob are going to unpack this in a really beautiful way. But we've got to ask ourselves this. We, we toss around love one, I mean, we just need to love one another. We toss it around a lot. Good. But are we willing? to seek first to give rather than get in our relationships and to do this in the wake of having surrendered preference? That's a tough question, isn't it? But it's a necessary one. Are we willing to seek first to give rather than get in our relationships and to do this in the wake of having surrendered preference? If we answer yes to this, we have answered yes to being the church, we have answered yes to life and the only possibility of life. To say no, things collapse like a house of cards in pretty stunning fashion. To say yes, you've got these action markers in, in your discipleship process here in which you said one of them is that, man, we are, we are striving for our habits to match those of Jesus Christ. We say yes to that. We never look more like Jesus than when we love like this. Let's go ahead and stand. I want to say a prayer and we're going to close with a song.